you. Um, this is my first hack night. It's really exciting. This is an awesome group and a huge group, and so I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Normally, when I talk about this topic, it's either people who count energy and know a lot about KBTUs. Um, I, I know there was an energy model, modeler, but I only heard about one. And then, or people who think about building management and count dollars per square foot of leasable rent or rentable space. But um, this group is totally a slightly different audience than what I normally talk to, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, so again, my name is Amy Jewell. I work for something called the City Energy Project. Um, it's a nonprofit working with several uh, 20 cities across the U.S. on um, advancing local energy policies and programs. Chicago is one of the lucky 20 cities um, to be a part of that. So I work full time in the mayor's office supporting, advising, and implementing programs and policies focusing on energy efficiency in the city of Chicago. So I'm going to uh, talk about Chicago energy benchmarking, um, where we are today, a little bit about what it is, what the data is. Uh, data are that we've been releasing, um, just to make you aware of some of this data that's out there um, <clears throat> and just kind of get your thoughts and we'll have some Q&A at the end. Um, recently, the city did, so this, uh, I'll get a little bit into the history in a second, but the picture here is our most recent report on this particular ordinance. Um, we released it in January and the link of, to where you can download it is there, along with anything you ever wanted to know about this particular ordinance. So, um, <clears throat> I always start with this slide as a little bit of background. So why does the city of Chicago care about energy use in buildings? Um, so the city has developed a couple of different foundational um, documents that help guide sustainability. The first is the Chicago Climate Action Plan. It goes back almost a decade. It was developed, I believe, in 2008. It has long-term goals for carbon reduction, which you can see on the slide there. Um, recently, the city released a report showing a 7% reduction in carbon emissions from 2010 to 2015. So we're making progress as a city, but we have a ways to go. Um, more recently, the city developed something called the Sustainable Chicago Action Agenda. It's more of a shorter term roadmap for sustainability um, <clears throat> that identifies different themes and actions the city's going to focus on to hit those long term carbon reduction goals. Um, and here's a quote from the mayor. I'd say that the takeaway from this slide is really both of these documents and a lot of the city's work on sustainability focuses on energy and buildings um, <clears throat> because there's a huge opportunity um, to both save money and reduce emissions and clean up our environment. In Chicago, um, carbon, uh, uh, the energy used in buildings, so both electricity and natural gas, make up a little over 70% of the city's total carbon emissions. So if we don't address this, we'll never hit any long-term carbon reduction goals. Um, and it's been a huge focus of the sustainability work at the city for a while now. <clears throat> so that's why the city cares about energy efficiency. Um, what is the city doing? So the goal is let's accelerate what's happening. A lot of work has been happening in this field. Some of it's driven by the state level. Um, the utilities both have energy efficiency programs where they have rebates and incentives for different types of um, energy efficiency actions. But when the city thinks about it, I think we kind of divide things into both voluntary programs and the code, which is mandatory. Um, so um, for for um, mandatory things, we, we have this um, benchmarking ordinance, the Building Energy Transparency, um, and energy codes which relate to new construction as well as major rehabs of existing buildings. Um, on the voluntary side, we have something called Retrofit Chicago. So I'm talking today about the Building Energy Transparency, um, but if you're curious about anything else, just let me know and you can grab me later. So for... Um, transparency, the city passed this ordinance back in 2013. It really seeks to raise awareness of energy performance through information and transparency. It is a information-based ordinance, so um, as you'll hear in a second, people who have to comply with this ordinance, they don't have to do anything if their efficiency is not good, but they, um, they do have to report the data every year to the city. Um, the information gets into the hands of, de of decision makers and into the public realm. Um, <clears throat> The goal is to really just improve transparency and use that to drive change. So the essentials of this ordinance, um, it was passed in 2013. We started rolling it in in 2014. Here's what you have to do 
if you are building like this one, larger than 50,000 square feet, you have to track the energy use for the entire building, all electricity, all natural gas, anything else, once a year. Report that to the city once a year, and then every three years, do some data verification. Uh, the city is then authorized to make that data public after the second year that the um, property reports under the ordinance. Um, it uses a tool developed by the US EPA called Energy Star Portfolio Manager. That's what the logo looks like. It's free, it's pretty easy to use, um, and that's the basics of what buildings and their owners or property managers have to do. So we phased this in over time, um, and basically, as I mentioned, um, we, we, it was a three-year phase-in period. So we started in 2014. Um, not very many buildings, just commercial or institutional buildings, 250,000 square feet and greater. And as you can see, in 2015 and 2016, we brought in more buildings. So the light blue bars show when you have to do the benchmarking and reporting. <clears throat> and the red Chicago star is when you have to do the data verification. So now everyone's been phased in um, as of the end of last year, and we're starting that cycle over this year in 2017. Um, we wouldn't be a very good data or transparency ordinance without some data. So this is what um, compliance has looked like over the past four years. So as I mentioned, 2014 was a pretty small year. We had less than 300 buildings that were required to do anything. Last year, we're up to a little over 3,500, and that should remain pretty steady going forward. You can see the compliance rate by... Um, Number of properties has been in the 80 to 90% range, and when you measure that by square footage, it's consistently over 90%. So now I'm gonna share a little more about the results we've seen, um, <clears throat> and then share, I'm gonna get to like what the data is are, and what kind of metrics we're sharing for the different buildings. So here's a map showing participation rates by neighborhood. Um, at the time we went to print with our, with our report, we had just under 2,700 total reports for different properties. Every neighborhood had at least one um, building that had, to do t that had to report. We had almost three quarters of a billion square feet of space, um, and all the energy in all those reporting buildings is just about a quarter of citywide energy use. All neighborhoods have at least one building, and most have five or more. So it's not surprising the neighborhoods closer to the lake and, of course, closer to the, the loop and the neighborhoods near the loop tend to have a little bit more of these bigger buildings that need to report. And some of the outlying neighborhoods are a little bit less dense and have not as many big buildings. So you'll see a, a little bit fewer numbers there. <coughs> so... Um, as I mentioned, um, the, the second year of building reports, the city is authorized to share their data. The first year is kind of a grace period, so if your building sucks, you can do something about it, and then uh, the next year you report, and the city will release your data at that point. Um, so we've released uh, two data sets on the data portal now, um, and thanks again to Do It for helping us get all that data out there. Um, <clears throat> and so um, there's two things up there. One is just the full list of every building required to comply. Um, and then the second is the results from the buildings that did comply. We also created a map, um, this interactive map that my organization helped to create. Um, you can create your own. Um, it's, it's meant to be a data visualization. You can create your own comparisons. Um, you can look at certain neighborhoods. Um, and both of these are linked on that main web page that I had on the front, front slide. So if you're interested in a building like this one, what kind of data can you find out? So there's four different categories of information that's been released for every building that's um, complied um, for at least uh, two years. So there's basic building information like the address, square footage, et cetera. Energy performance metrics, which is probably the key part of the report. Um, so energy use per square foot measured in a few different ways. Most buildings get a score on a scale of 1 to 100 called the Energy Star score. 100 is great, 1 is very bad, and 50 is the national median. Um, there's an article that came out about 
two or three weeks ago looking at the performance of the Trump Tower. Um, <laughs> anyone want to guess what their score was? On a scale of 1 to 100? It was great. Fantastic. It wasn't negative. I don't think you can get a negative. <laughs> It was, I believe, a, either a 9 or 11. Um, and then there was another reporter that followed up with a separate article. Uh, New York City has a very similar ordinance to this, and there's several Trump-owned buildings in New York City. They're all doing in that same range um, as well. So um, people are taking, taking note of this. It's interesting. Um, energy used by fuel source, so if you want to know the exact amount of electricity, natural gas, or other fuels used by each building that's in there. Um, and then carbon emissions from each building, and then carbon per square foot. So this, that's what's been released now. Um, those are the main metrics. Um, so is this working? We think so. Um, buildings that have now reported for three years in a row, remember we phased it in over time, so the buildings that have reported for three years in a row, we're seeing about a 4% total reduction in energy use, that is weather normalized, so it takes into account like a really hot summer here or a really cold winter there, um, and that we think has saved almost 12 million in utility costs per year, and their scores are going up. Same trend for buildings reporting two years in a row, about a 2% energy savings, and um, <clears throat> $6 million in cost savings. Their scores are also going up. So we think this is, um, the information is getting into the hands of people who are starting to make better decisions. <clears throat> and we're hoping it's also going to um, spur the public, spur tenants, people living in those buildings, working in those buildings to take note and start to take action as well. So this also shows some overall trends of that um, 1 to 100 energy star score. This is the distribution of that over all building sectors. Median in Chicago was 59, so we're above the national average, which is good. Um, but we did some analysis and saw that, <coughs> excuse me, um, if all the buildings were to reach median levels or above median levels for energy use per square foot, there would be a lot of energy could still be saved. So we think there's still a lot of energy waste happening and a lot still to be done. Um, the question I always get is, so what's the city doing with this data other than publishing it? Um, great question. So anyone that reported and complied with this ordinance gets an email back and you get a peer comparison, kind of like if you've heard of OPower, those, um, those reports. Um, that compares your building to similar peer buildings in Chicago, and then some ideas about how to improve performance. Um, <clears throat> nationally, the Department of Energy is working to get this into the hands of people who regularly buy, sell, or rent space in buildings through a partnership with a company called CoStar. Um, locally, um, Local partners are actually using this data to help inform the design of new construction, which is really interesting. Um, and so the way that works is when you have a new building, you're designing, you can actually set energy targets before you even put a shovel in the ground and say, here's the average in Chicago, we're gonna hit this level, which is much better than the average, hopefully. And um, so that's some pilot programs around that are um, happening now in Chicago. Here are the resources, um, the report, there's an infographic, um, the data portal, the links to that. Um, the data portal also has its own map and then the additional map that I mentioned as well. And um, we're open for questions, but I know that you're supposed to ask me questions. I actually had questions for you. So um, I'd love to hear any of your thoughts on where this data could be useful, other platforms we might want to think about getting it out there, what other ways could this data be used to encourage upgrades to improve energy performance, and then any questions you have for me. Um, I guess front row. Uh, are these benchmarks normalized to the, the population or the use of the building at all? Yes, they are. So it's both. Um, it's, it, it takes into account the size of the building, what the building is used for. You, when you set this up in the software, you tell the software what the building is used for. Um, and it takes into account occupancy levels and all of those things. Um, OK. Front row again, sorry. 
where do buildings typically see the biggest improvement in energy use? And that could also be a way to like help people. It's like, hey, this caused X percent, but it only costs this much. It's really easy. That's a tough question because this is, um, yeah, I, I should probably think of a better analogy. But energy benchmarking kind of tells you roughly where you are, but doesn't necessarily pinpoint the, all the sources of the energy waste. So we're looking at annual whole building data, and we're comparing you to some peer buildings and giving you a score. Um, if you get a score of 40, you know you have a lot of room to improve. If you get a score of 80, you know you're doing all right. But beyond that, you're going to have to do additional investigation to find that out. Um, <clears throat> usually, if you've never done anything, lighting is the best place to start in most buildings because it's cheap, um, has a quick payback, it's fairly easy to do, um, but it does vary building to building um, to figure out where the energy is being wasted. I just had a comment. I thought maybe uh, awards might be a good idea of certain scores attained as far as marketability. Buildings and people always love to see they're, they're yeah. kind of out there getting, you know, silver or sustainability award or yeah. something along those lines. I didn't mention it. If you get a score of 75 or above, you can get the Energy Star label on your building. It's like the Energy Star label when you buy, like, an appliance. Um, and the city has awards in a separate, on our voluntary program, but that is a great idea to kind of think about other awards because everyone does love to get that plaque. <laughs> they just love it. Get right here. Uh, thank you. How many cities are, uh, are collecting data like this across the United States? Uh, I think we're up to around 15 cities in a county out in near Washington, D.C. and, and a couple and of states. And what are the geographic patterns of the different scores and what's correlated with that? Oh, um, there's some data on that in our report. Um, uh, the scores are, are pretty much normalized by climate, so you don't actually see better scores in places like Florida or Seattle. Um, but certain cities have been doing this longer. Um, You're saving a line. We're saving some energy here. <laughs> Either that or it's romantic benchmarking time. Um, <laughs> like when the restaurants turn down the light. Um, so certain cities have been doing this longer and they have some more aggressive policies. In some cities, you, you're required to benchmark and do an energy audit every 10 years, or you're required to benchmark and upgrade your lighting in New York City, for example. So um, those cities tend to um, see a little bit better performance. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's all over the map. Chicago's kind of, we're, we're doing better than the national average compared to some of the other cities that have publicly available data. It depends on the building sector, um, but I can I can send you a link to the report and show you where that data are. Yeah, um, over here in the back, you can ask questions if you're in the back, and I will try to get you. Um, okay, so yeah, first off, I love kind of what the what your organization does, and uh, pretty excited about that. Um, first question is. Do you guys, as kind of a next step or as something to answer number two there, um, do you guys partner with organizations that maybe, you know, you send out brochures to the lower Energy Star ratings or the lower ratings and say, hey, listen, your peers in this city, your peers across the country are at this level, you're at this level, and then here's some actionable next steps that you can do to get a higher score? Or? Yeah, they get an email that has that, um, but we are going to... Um, work with a partner to do a pilot this year to do just that. So we're going to try to pinpoint buildings with low scores. Maybe some of them are going to be nonprofits or houses of worship or buildings with financial needs so that we can reach out to them and, ask, and offer them some additional help. So we're going to try that this year and see how it goes. We're going to do a pilot, hopefully, with somewhere in the range of 50 buildings um, to get enrolled. But I think that's a huge opportunity, and we'd have to work with a lot of other nonprofits in this area to get that done for sure. But cool. And then my second question is, if you had unlimited resources, uh, what's one? Is there something that you would like really want to do with this? Or hmm. that's a great question. Um, I think if the if if we had unlimited resources, I would think about 
and um, the folks at City Hall maybe don't tell them this. I would think about lowering the threshold to below 50,000 square feet. New York City just did that. They require any building now 25,000 square feet and up to comply. And I think in New York, that's an extra seven or 8,000 buildings. So um, getting some of the smaller buildings involved in this, it's a little bit harder though, because those buildings don't have as much resources to do the benchmarking and to do the energy work. Um, so they'd need a lot more hand-holding to get it done. Right here, that's okay. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of curious, uh, first of all, I think it's a great project and I appreciate the data being on the data portal as well. I'm curious as to like the sort of organizational, uh, where the funding for this came from. Like I noticed it's a partnership with City Energy. I wonder if you could explain what City Energy is and how that's funded and how when you talk about these like reporting requirements, is that being required by the people who are funding this or is it coming from where exactly? Okay, so the ordinance is a city of Chicago ordinance. It's required by the city. So the city of Chicago is requiring any building in the city of Chicago to do this. That's 50,000 square feet or greater. There are a few exemptions available. So um, industrial or manufacturing buildings, for example, don't have, don't have to do this. Um, <clears throat> my organization is a nonprofit. It's funded through foundations. Um, I'm, in, I'm on the ground helping the city with this for three years. And then um, at the end of that three years, we'll do additional fundraising probably to keep this role continuing. But we work with many, many other partners, one of which is located in this building, US Green Building Council, Illinois, um, and many other nonprofits to do this. And they all have different funding sources. Did you guys have a hand in crafting the ordinance? We had a hand in crafting okay. it. The, the, several partners came together and formed this huge working group to create the ordinance. Um, Chicago was, I think, the sixth city in the U.S. to pass this, so we were able to learn from some of the other cities that came before us. Um, we got a partnership together with the city and mostly nonprofit organizations and some for-profit energy service providers were involved in that. And we had the utilities involved from the, the get-go as well because they have to provide the data. Um, <clears throat> so that working group created the ordinance and helped get it passed and then are supporting it as well. Yeah. Um, right here, and then you're next. Uh, among the architectural community and some of the building community, there's what's called LEED, the, the LEED sustainability. Is there any kind of a correlation between what you're doing with the energy performance and, and lead buildings that have been built at, that are have different levels of lead capabilities? Yes. So on a very basic level, you can get points towards your lead certification for having really good energy performance. And the way you measure that is the same tool that we use for this, uh, the portfolio manager tool. Um, we also looked at buildings that had been lead certified in the last, I think, three to five years, and we looked at their energy performance. In Chicago, the LEED certified buildings are doing better than the non-LEED certified buildings when it comes to their energy performance. Other cities haven't found that as much, and I think that's limited to office buildings. We didn't have enough data to do that analysis for other building types. But we did find that, and it's in our report, so I can point you to that. You had a question here? Thank you. So who actually gets the credit for uh, a good or bad rating for Energy Star? Is it the multiple tenants of the building, a, a leasing group like CBRE, JLL, or the construction company that made the building itself? That's a great question. We don't really give credit. Um, the people that have to do this, technically it's the building owner or that person's agent or building manager. Um, tenants don't typically have much to do with this. So um, the data comes from the utility, so you don't have to go to your tenants and get data from them or anything. If a building is doing really well in terms of their energy performance, it probably depends. To answer that question, you'd have to look at what kind of building it is. Um, <clears throat> a building like this, they've actually done a lot in the merchandise mart to make the spaces more efficient. So that's the, the ownership usually working with property management. Um, but in, in many cases, you will need to work with tenants to get them to do things as well. So to get a really high score, tenants probably had been involved at some point in a building like this or an office building or um, a condo building. So it really depends. I'm sorry, that probably wasn't a very satisfying answer, but <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, can we one sure. All right, right here. Hi, thanks for the presentation, really informative. 
Do you think that um, one of the speed bumps that you know, especially smaller buildings have to adopt these energy measures is the cost? So I know that there's a lot of information on you know emissions and stuff like that, but you know the direct cost. And you guys help kind of debunk some of the myths towards that. It's a great question. We we constantly ask ourselves why aren't people doing more of this? It seems easy, and and some of the easier things don't cost that much. I think it again it depends. Probably one of the biggest barriers is just lack of knowledge, lack of information. Um, not only about the building's energy performance, which this obviously helps fix that, but about you know uh, what you can do to start taking action. So if you get a score of 30, you might not know really what to do. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, both utilities offer rebate and incentive programs. In some cases, they'll come and change out your light bulbs for like no cost. I think there are still some programs that both ComEd that ComEd provides, but people don't know that much about them. Um, <clears throat> So you have to find out about those programs and enroll and um, have a little bit of knowledge to get it done. So we think there's just still some education that needs to happen. Um, for bigger upgrades, cost can be an issue, um, and it depends on the building type. Again, a nonprofit might have a harder time than a, a big skyscraper in the loop. So, um, so I think cost can be an issue depending on the building type as well. Oh, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Thank you All right. Very much. Thank you.